Before this episode begins, we'd like to take a moment to give you a little bit of background information. This episode deals with the sensitive issue of war and as such may not be suitable for all audiences. We felt it was important to discuss the effects of war on the scientific community and how it forces scientists to retool and change direction. I wanted a first-hand account of what's happening, so I spoke to my friend Christoph Andersons, a journalist in Latvia and the creator of the Eastern Border Podcast on the USSR and more modern Eastern European politics and history. He is also a PhD candidate in communication science. The Eastern Border Podcast is the oldest podcast in the Baltic states, currently focusing on the war in Ukraine, where Kristaps has gone to report from the ground extensively. Alternatively, for those of you who just wish to relax, Ross has put together a three-hour Fermi Paradox Marathon episode on our Clips channel. The link, as always, is in the description below and in a pinned comment. Kristaps Andresen, welcome to the program. Uh, hi, John. And you can just call me Chris. It's, it's easier that way. It is. It is. Now, Chris, you have been in an area that is very unsavory, very unpleasant, and shouldn't really be happening, Ukraine. And one thing you've been doing is looking at what happened to science in Ukraine. Now, science was hopefully... Back at the end of the Cold War, it was hoped that it would be the great unifier where the United States and Russia and everybody else, European Union, all of us, Canada, could go and sort of maybe solve our problems on, in a different playing field space. And that is no longer the case, unfortunately. That's fallen apart. Now, we still have scientists and scientists have a philosophy and it's a sort of a unified philosophy where you, you try to think logically and very, very critically to come to a conclusion that you hope describes reality. What's going on now? What is the interplay? What, what is left of scientific relations between the West and the East? Well, if you, if you mention Ukraine specifically, then uh, you have to remember that a lot of Soviet Union's greatest achievements in science came from Ukraine. In Ukraine, there were their IT centers where they built the Soviet computers, the big supercomputers, and also all the rocketry came from Ukraine. Korolev was Ukrainian, after all. And yeah, that was, so, so Ukraine has a long legacy and, and a bigger one than, that most people could probably imagine. But East and the West, well, uh, it's, it's, it's gone somewhere to places where we wouldn't want it to go. As in any major calamity during a war, you sort of turn your science in a political tool in a way. Ukraine takes pride right now in, in, for example, their drone engineering sector and that stuff is very, very developed now. In, in Russia, that's a, that's a bit different story where there seems to be a divide forming and, and actively enforced upon people. Yeah, may, maybe I'm not the best person to, to speak about this because, uh, well, I'm not exactly a scientist. I'm a, <laughs> I'm a journalist and a historian, but, but um, I, I just think it's... It's important to understand how uh, this this affects us all, because because back in the day, as as we've spoken before, the Soviet Union actually collaborated with with the United States and the West in in a lot of lot of matters. For example, the the famous Soviet tanks that won the World War Two, T thirty fours and BT twos. Well, they uh, they exist only because of American scientists and engineers of of, of Christie, you know. So the collaboration was important, and uh, I, I think that's that's going by the wayside at this point, which is really sad. Now, Kristaps, we should we should establish who you are. Now, you're a personal friend of mine, and you host the Eastern Border podcast, and you're a reporter based in Riga, in Latvia, and you go into these war zones and talk to people. What is that like? What sort of stress levels do you deal with when going in there and talking to people? I would like to add that also I am um, apparently the, the oldest podcast of the Baltic states. Somehow managed to start the thing here. But uh, yeah, tangents because it's actually pretty difficult. It's, it's difficult talking to people because well, if, when, once you've picked this profession, at one point you think it's going to be you know maybe adventurous and maybe interesting, but after a while it, it gets to you. If you take your job seriously, and I do, and I've been published not only on my podcast, but, but in other media, like in Foreign Policy magazine, it, it truly does get to you at one point. I, I could compare it to 
I don't know, working as one of those uh, re repeat scientists, you know, the guys who are out there in labs checking the results, repeating the experiments all the time, except that, uh, well, it's, it's a job that, that doesn't get you a lot of glory, but it's really, really necessary. It's kind of kind of that, except you, you also get psychological trauma sometimes, which is a real thing, sadly. It is, and it, it's shouldn't be happening. I mean, it's 2022. And yet we live in a world that resembles 1939, suddenly. And it, I, I also actually think that it resembles 1916 more than 1939. Well, you could say that World War One. And that's scary, because World War One is, I mean, people have called it the, the causeless war, or the useless war. And we all went to war, essentially over treaties, essentially. And I mean, it was more complicated than that. But but we end up with with this yeah, but, forced war, essentially. Yeah, but but there's there's also a tiny sliver of hope which I'd like to I like to throw in, because among all the corporations that have been put under sanctions, there is one that isn't, and that's super important one. That's Rosatom, because Russia Russia is one of the few countries on Earth that does build nuclear reactors in other countries, and Rosatom is the corporation that does that. Rosatom is continuing; they're working with other people, so at least we have that for now, because Rosatom leaving half built nuclear reactors and can just stopping maintenance on the existing ones, that would be not good. Yeah, that, that would be really bad. So that there exists. Now, we also have murmurs of discontent in other areas of the world right now, which I know that Russia works closely with, with particularly Iran. And we now have protests going there and all sorts of things. And invariably, when you have that going on, they are going to do things, et cetera, as they, as they have since 1979. What is the trigger in this? World War I, the trigger was multiple countries to, declaring war against each other. Are we in that danger now, in your view, as an Eastern European? Are we, are we in that? Because you may have a, a more uncolored view on this than I do, being an American. I think that there is a bit of danger. I, I think that Putin's... Well, for one, I think Putin is not a rational agent in the standard sense of the word, as as you would use it, because he lives by a different set of values and, and fundamental beliefs than most people do. But there is sadly a danger of, of that happening, but I, uh, uh, there's also increased chance of terrorism, obviously, because of all the radical groups that are under arms right now. But it's it's not that big, it's not world ending, but it's clearly there. For for me, it's a bit likely, a bit more scary, I suppose, because my country is just right next door to Russia, and we used to be part of the Soviet Union, so we're um, in a bit more active danger. But yeah, war sadly has become possible. Nuclear war has also become possible, and uh, it, it kind of scares me when uh, my grandmother, who lived through World War II and had been, you know, under shelling herself and bombed, I grew up with this attitude that the main thing for her, as a Soviet born and raised person, was the main thing is not to have wars anymore. Let there be peace, and that was into her, even uh, even though she had like grown up in the Soviet Union, and Soviet Union all the time was also in, worried that the Americans might start a war, and right now it, it kind of feels like an extra extra layer of betrayal when all these uh, Soviet values, which in fact were all about more like peace in a way, are used to justify this this horrific thing that's going on. How is, in, in specifically in the Baltic states, how is the legacy of Gorbachev seen? Because what, from our perspective over here, he was a man of peace, and we were able to work with him, and much more so than now, than you know, working with Vladimir Putin. So what is your view on the legacy of Gorbachev from the perspective of the Baltic states? Well, it's, it's a dual thing. Yes, he did a lot of good things at the same time when Chernobyl happened. He hid the information at first, and he sent out children on the streets to do 1st of May parade to show that everything was fine when it wasn't, just to hide the information. He also is responsible for 13 deaths in Vilnius when people were caused by tanks during the protests. It wasn't as simple. He definitely wasn't as bad as the other leaders, and he did a lot of good, but he's a very complex personality, a very mixed one. Gorbachev is seen as in a way, as a person that could have done much more evil things, much worse, but he didn't, so that's good. But he's also not not seen as a, any way a, a saint. And and but his reputation has been improving lately since when people remember leaders of the past. Uh, 
yeah, if you if you compare it to what's going on now, then obviously he's a he's a bit better one. Inside of Russia, however, he's extensively seen as a traitor, as someone who allowed the Soviet Union to collapse and and who had worked with the evil Americans, as they say, to, to collapse it. It's it's weird. All in all, he's a complex personality over here. I've noticed that. I've noticed that, that, that he is definitely not seen the same way, which makes me wonder if my, my uh, biases and perceptions from back then, you know, I was 15 when the Soviet Union fell, that my biases and perceptions color the views. So you, one must always be very cognizant of that, that maybe you don't have the right story or you have a colored story. And that's been that's been the lesson of history, though, that propaganda exists and that you have these many different views that the historians later figure out. Now, what do you think is the way out? What can we do to tamp this conflict down and basically do things like secure Chernobyl and the, the uh, Ukrainian uh, nuclear sites that seem to have been flagrantly attacked just because they were nuclear sites, which is reckless as, as all get up? Yes, well, currently Russian troops are inside a nuclear reactor from which they are shelling Ukrainian positions and Ukraine can't shoot back because that would cause troubles. But uh, sadly, I don't see a way out of this uh, with, a, with a peace talk anymore. It's, it's gone, gone too far because, understandably, Zelensky and any Ukrainian, they just don't want to talk to Putin at all. And, and Putin is not to be trusted. He's betrayed people so many times and, and he's broken deals and, and and like and any deal that you can make with Putin you know that he's just going to break it when it'll suit him Putin has to be removed somehow he has to go there there needs to be some sort of reforms in in Russia but, but Putin needs to be ousted from his position either internally or 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 somehow i i don't know but uh the, the this this kind of needs to change a bit because if if you look at the situation here, then you you look at Putin, you understand that it's it's kind of like a kind of like a mafia cartel literally would would take control over the country and and try to enforce their their views on everyone, which they are actively doing, because it's basically that they they got caught with cocaine in, in the embassy in Argentina, like with Putin party's logo slapped all over it. They use diplomatic mail to smuggle cocaine inside Russia. I mean, it is a cartel at this point. Yes, very disconcerting. Now, censorship is key to this because there must be a vast blanket of censorship going on regarding this conflict. My question for you is, how does this affect science? With the interplay of science and peer review process and the discussion, you know, the global discussion of what science is and what we've discovered and what everybody is doing in different labs, whatever country, what Paul has this cast on science and the free flow of information? Oh, that's going to be a long one to answer, but uh, that's the important one here. See, censorship started way back before the war, even. I was directly in touch with this when before the previous Putin's elections, or before Putin, previous previous time he ran, there was a documented uh, case that was got big on YouTube, where the Russian Academy of Sciences, the Siberian section, they had an ecology summit, a conference where they were just looking at the data about the ecological situation in various Siberian industrial towns, where their industry is, where their nuclear experimental sites are, all that stuff, oil and everything. And the situation was super bad. And in some cases, the air pollution levels, if I, if I remember, was like 17 to 40 times the norm. That's times. And in some cities, you have purple snow falling. And, and that happened just after their military spilled chemical weapons in the Pacific Ocean. So the guys on the coast who were surfing got chemical burns. Yeah, it was, it was weird. And they had this conference in Siberia to talk about the ecological health of Siberia. All the ecologists and, and geologists and everyone came together. And they basically formed the paper that said, well, everything is terrible because no one is doing, everything is corrupt and our situation is horrible. We're going to see more wildfires and everything. And then the most famous part is that the director of, of this the Russian Academy of Sciences Siberian section stepped up and said, and he didn't know he was being filmed at that point, that they can't release this to public. They can't release this to anyone because that would make Putin look bad. And that was filmed and that, that went, went, went outside there. And, and that, that's how I got in touch with them. And that was before other things, because after this, after the self-censorship that was in place, they also have rules, for example, about the Ministry of Enlightenment, which is different from Ministry of Education. If you want to be a science educator, like you are, John, 
then you have to receive a special permit. You can't say things that are not on the official program. All this is turning into, in Russia, in a position where they want to isolate themselves, which is unlike things happening in, in, in everywhere else, basically. Because scientists are seen as, well, one, the, the people who carry on the legacy of the Soviet Union, but at the same time, they're seen as dangerous because of they go to international conferences, they, may, they might expose secrets. The international conferences also are an iffy question, since you have to receive a special permit to go on those. And, and they're, they're the agent, which probably doesn't understand anything that you're working on, might just decide that you might reveal state secrets somehow and not let you go on the conference or that, that you're not good enough, just like in, in the Soviet days. Sounds so Soviet, doesn't it? All right. So was there ever an interruption in, in Russian science where, OK, Soviet Union falls, it's, say, 1993. Were there still permits required in those days, in the Yeltsin days, to actually go to conferences? Or is this something imposed under Putin and brought back? No, this is, this is really new. Back in Yeltsin days, there was uh, a lot of relative freedom. We were poor, but we were not stupid. That's uh, a thing. But uh, Yeltsin really believed in, in liberties. He didn't, didn't do this. At that point, Soviet science, what was left of it in the wake of everything, found out that there exists such things as private funding and corporations and you know other institutions besides the state government that require science. So that's when the big, big internationalization happened. I mean, a lot of Russians and Ukrainians and people from the Baltic states have found their homes and, and research institutions elsewhere. And that mostly happened during during the Yeltsin era. And interestingly enough, interestingly enough, uh, this whole Putin's attitude towards the more censorship and everything that that's a way how to, how he's trying to fix brain drain. Because if you're an educated professional and you see where all of this is going and you feel more oppressed and you have no liberties and you can't vote and, and your salary is not that good, then you want to move elsewhere and that's caused the major issue. And and that's that's the scary part because it's going to get worse now. Yeah, for, for, for the Russian side, they're going to really see brain drain now. But but you, you have to understand that this this was this was horrible to the point where Russian engineers in uh, and I think it, it was Vostochny, one of their cosmodromes, they were caught mining Bitcoin on their work supercomputers. They they were doing this because a rocket scientist in Roscosmos, your average one that's not in the boss level. I remember this because that was in 2020. The exchange rate might have changed now, but back then a rocket scientist in Russia made about 250 to 350 dollars per month. That's a, an enormous disparity. <laughs> That's an enormous disparity. Do you think that that ultimately led to the decline of Roscosmos? In other words, they haven't exactly been up to par with what the USA and ESA are doing in rocketry, and they're sort of falling to the wayside. Do you think that that lack of investment, that lack of equity, so to speak, is responsible for the decline of Russian rocketry? Well, there is a, about Roscosmos, there is a saying in Russian that um, people involved in the industry often used to say to describe the situation. It's, Prasti Yuram if you I won't translate that one because that's a bit rude. It's like, sorry, Yura, but we uh, insert bleep here, everything. Uh, the, the problem with Roscosmos was Dmitry Rogozin, personally. He was he was not a very clever man, so to speak. As an example, he, he had gone to do interviews in, in media claiming that Russians must have, a, must have an extra chromosome from all, their, from all their endurance and everything. Just weird and wrong. And uh, yeah, it was, it was seen as a matter of pride, but... Cosmos and all this has declined since the general level of education has declined, since schools are not being funded, and since all, and, and everything is just being corruption, low level, high level, everywhere. And this is this is the most painful thing about yeah, about this because for for the Soviet people, for people in Eastern Europe, and I'm, I'm Latvian, and, and my part was and that was annexed in the Soviet Union. The only thing we liked about the Soviet Union here in Latvia was the space program. That was the thing that kept everything kind of together because we didn't like the Soviet administration. We didn't like the military. We didn't like anything, really. We didn't like socialism. Uh, well, the Soviet socialism. But we liked the, so the, the fact that Soviets went to space. We loved Gagarin. Riga was almost renamed Gagarin at one point. 
and and to see that going by the wayside right now, that's that's the most painful part because it turns out that Vostochny, the Cosmodrome they built, uh, is not usable for launches because it was built in the wrong position and with miscalculations and everything. Yeah, this this legacy of of space exploration by Russia is just unthinkable in a way. I I grew up like you you probably grew up uh, with with children's books about Armstrong and everything, and I grew up about Soviet books where it was said that we will overcome them and everything, and I and then there were plans about Mars missions and everything, and and I think I think this whole space endeavor was um, was the only thing where the Soviets truly really shined in a way. That was the truly Soviet thing, and. It's painful to see. There was one other. Oh, oh. There was one other, and it is the periodic table. Russian science was ruling the area of material science and and synthesizing new elements. Talking and, about periodic table, I have I have a, a, a scientific anecdote for you. See, Mendeleev is at least here in my parts. Mendeleev is is uh, credited with with inventing the thing, and he also got in the Russian Tsarist era a um, imperial medal for scientific excellence. Uh, but that was after his periodic table. But he got this medal, not because of that, but because he spent about a month with uh, some fellow noblemen testing out the perfect uh, alcohol percentage in, in vodka. They spent a month <laughs> doing testing things yes, and, and then, then they come up with this. So he got the Medal of Excellence, the highest order you could get in, in, in Tsarist Russia about this, with, with that. But yeah, but the mineral wealth of Russia... That's another thing. They, they have it, but they don't have the technologies to extract it. And, and that's because people who extract it don't see the benefits of it. This is why I like to, on my show at least, which is, which is political, rather compare Russia to a, um, to a colonial state than uh, a federation. And because everything in Russia is, is registered in Moscow. Imagine if every United States company would be registered in New York City, for example. Like you, you get oil in Texas, but all the tax money from the profits go to New York or Washington or whatever. And then that city gets to decide where everything goes. The people actually working in those areas, they don't see a lot of profits themselves. That's another reason. Well, that effect that effect does exist here. <laughs> I won't lie. But it doesn't do it so in such a pronounced manner. Now, YouTuber drain. I have noticed that a lot of Russian YouTubers, if they want to remain active, have left. And they're usually situating in in surrounding countries like Georgia or Armenia, places like that, to avoid the, the to avoid Russia as best they can, and especially since you know, if you're a young YouTuber, you can get drafted. And it seems to me that Russia is turning itself into a place where innovation leaves now and leaves quickly. It's not just brain drain; it's brain flight. What are your thoughts on that? It is. It is so. Yes, because. People in Russia, that's the biggest issue. People in Russia who are well-educated and would be considered the experts in other countries, they see that they have no perspectives. They have no political power. They're, they're being controlled in the work because, well, all the, all the main scientific institutions in Russia are state-funded, which means that Putin sees them as also tools for his own gains. Uh, people who work in these institutions uh, often are just drafted and forced to go and forcibly vote for Putin, pretend that they're happy. This mostly affects uh, people in, in universities. A lot of students, if they decide to go to a protest, they can be thrown out of college. And if the students also have been threatened with being thrown out of college if they don't vote for Putin in elections, it's, it's just a thing there. And because lack of private, private activity and lack of private activity happens because rich oligarchs can just take over your business. It's, it's kind of a chain way. Putin's also kind of stuck in, in, the, in the mentality of, of uh, late 19th century, I think, Tsarist in Russia. He doesn't have a smartphone. He doesn't use the internet. He gets his reports from the internet in a little red binder given to him by his secret services, just like in Stalin's era, you see. He, he doesn't understand how internet works. For, for him, science is something mysterious and and internally, uh, he also has to kind of show some results to people where they are, where there are none. Which means that there are companies that just buy Chinese consumer-grade drones, present them as Russian invention, something new, and get funds for that. And, and to show the advancements in Russian sciences in their in one of their science fairs last year, they dressed up a person to look like a robot, and then he danced on the stage just to show that we have a robot that can dance. No one was worried that there was just a person dressed in robot clothes, which was pretty open. It's just weird. They 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 tried it. I don't know. 30 years ago, you know, it's, it's, it's 30 years ago. 
the ideology of, of the 20th century is still with us. Now, in Ukraine, science is hobbled by the fact that there is a war raging. What have you heard from Ukrainian scientists in regards to how their research and proceeding with their research is being challenged by the war? Well, I have more contacts with Ukrainian military and politicians rather than scientists. But but at least when, when, when there is electricity, a lot of places continue working. Now, of course, uh, students and a lot of people volunteered for this war and it's being disrupted. It's not going as normal. But people are still working. People are still trying to function as best as, the best as they can. It's a similar situation there, as by now, war has become the new normal. Uh, and that sometimes stuns me, since when I was there at the beginning of the war, everyone was panicking, and then every, nothing worked, including science or anything else. But right now, right now, people are just trying to act as if everything was normal. You know, our streets have blog posts, and you might not have electricity, and there are shells there, but Ukrainians are tough people, and they've, they've been getting used to this. In Ukrainian science, there's a lot of potential there, and obviously funds are not as welcoming as they, they used to be, but then again, they're used to corruption issues, but, well, I, I know that they're still working. It's not easy for them. Not, it's not easy for anyone. And there's especially a lot of work if, if you work in, I don't know, engineering sectors or, or things like that. Uh, again, it's, it's, it's hard to put in, put in a, three sentences together, how does work impact an industry? Well... Well, if if your if your lab aides go away because they've joined the army and your funding is being uh, well cut because Ukraine's money goes to well war efforts, and if your lab loses electricity because Russia is bombing your civilian infrastructure, and if you if you don't know if your experiment is gonna you know even even go through because in the middle of it you might have to run down to the bomb shelter, <laughs> yeah, that, that that would make work difficult for a scientist, I think. No, no question, no question. Now, Kristaps, as a member state of NATO, Latvia, and a member of the European Union, what is the average Latvian's perception of what's going on in Russia? In other words, how, how filtered is the information when it gets to us in the West as opposed to what you hear when you go into Ukraine or you talk to contacts behind the front line? Uh, that's, an, that's a huge issue, actually, because... That's my work currently. I started my show explaining the Soviet Union and, and, and Eastern European history and everything that it switched to war. But the biggest issue with, with all this is fighting myths. For some reason, uh, people who are in the West, they tend to not understand, they, they, they tend to not, not see the lies as, as lies as easily. And, and Russia plays on this fact. They play on the fact that uh, the opposing side, the informational conflict, will mostly spend their time just having to debunk the occasional whatever nonsense comes out of their mouths, like bio labs in Ukraine, combat mosquitoes, all that nonsense, right? A lot of time in the West is wasted by just uh, taking this seriously and like, but what if this could happen? They just overplay things. And uh, I made an episode about this at one point because I was angry when... Um, when I think it was, I think it was Elon Musk on Twitter that did this when he posted his opinions on 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 Putin and everything. In the West, a lot of people treat Putin as if he would be just another businessman, just another you know state the state's leader. When in fact, he should be seen as a mafia boss. He lives by the unwritten laws of the Russian organized crime, the panyatia, and. And because he's been so in close contact with them, and he has taught, and he has been in the organized crime. So, for example, in, in according to Putin's worldview, making an honest deal is dishonorable. There is only everything is zero sum game. There is only the guy who cheats and the guy who's a loser and gets cheated. That that's one of the issues, and there are other nuances like that, which are hard to understand for for Western Western media in general, and. They, they tend to kind of underplay this this mentality factor which is definitely there and they lack this intimate knowledge they have they have more big data but big data also said that this war wouldn't happen but their interpretation of, of the of the data is often either misleading or or just wrong in in, in the sense the same with uh, how Russia just uh, outplays people in, in the global stage by just pushing their positions uh, often 
with where Karachi just th threatens everyone with, with nuclear weapons and no one bothers to check whether or not they're working. But, but yeah, that's, that's the hardest part of this is I'm, I'm trying to explain this is the fact that in a lot of cases, I do have to spend a lot of time answering questions, which I know is just random nonsense coming out of Russian propaganda, but someone in the West takes it seriously. So then you have to spend time countering that and then you can't provide news. That's the, that's the big issue. And, and the fact that a lot of people in the West, they're used to good life, as we would say, Ajira Besitsa, the other Russian saying, they're used to normalcy, but normalcy can mean various different things. And, and this this saying I'll translate, there's a Russian thing that's going on for a long time, that's the Eastern European thing, which is just a, a standard phrase that we use to compare stuff like, we say apples to oranges, we say what's medicine what's medicine to Russians is death to Germans thing. And, and people tend to underplay this. There's another effect in that the West tends tends to counter Russian activity, all right, with activity of our own. So in other words, we do things like gigantic rocket launches, <laughs> like we just did, and things like go to the moon and all that. And it almost seems, geopolitically speaking, that the idea is to try to send a message that at least we haven't lost our edge, perhaps. Do you see that? Do you see a Western response that appears to be Cold War-like in the old game of chess, you know, the brinksmanship in, in, in this as well? So in other words, is there a Western effect of a kind of propaganda? Again, you're asking me complex questions. I should have expected that, but I have to give complex answers to them. Western response is very diplomatic. See, and again, in Putin's mentality, he respects strength. And that's also the Soviet mentality thing that we all know that you have to push back to Putin, you have to be strong to Putin. But that's a thing that is lacking in a lot of people here in the post-Soviet sphere, including Putin, is that we can understand the basic rules of survival and can be tough, but we're not good at the ladder of escalation. West, Western, Western side is really well doing this ladder of escalation. They're, they're not playing their hand out, right? They're just slowly stepping everything up. They're worried about some nuclear response from Russia, which I think is, well, it is possible, but I think it's most, more likely that they'll just nuke some, some uninhabited territory because them nuking, nuking Ukraine would be just, I, I don't believe that would happen. That would be a massive political catastrophe for Putin himself. But the West response, well, again, depending on the country. Really much depending on the country. I can I can state that at this point in Ukraine, well, and in the Baltic states too, by the way, uh, United States are we, we did a we did a social um, social polling recently. United States is our uh, third most popular foreign country. Number one and two are our neighbors, Latvia, Lithuania, and in uh, and in Ukraine, United States is the number two most popular country. Number one being Poland. So hey, West response is. I think working pretty well in, in some cases, and that might be rare. But uh, yeah, over here in Eastern Europe, we actually really much like the United States of America, which is, is a diplomatic achievement, at least for you guys. <laughs> it used to not be that way. <laughs> well, the real diplomatic achievement was Sweden and Finland applying for NATO. Um, oh. That's the biggest loss Russia has taken as not, far as geopolitics not, goes. Not that. No, see, their impact is huge, okay? But that would have happened. They had trigger laws for that. They had been preparing for that. Sweden was neutral on paper only. They had been always working with NATO people. And uh, it was just another like nice excuse to finally push it through uh, because of pop popular opinion. That thing is important in strategic level, but on the political level, uh, this this didn't the war didn't change as much, to be honest, because yeah, uh, Sweden and, and Finland were always you know they they would have thrown in as soon as something bad happens something they they would have just joined NATO anyways. So yeah, it was just a trigger. Th yeah. That was just a trigger, but but it's still an interesting thing because. What I don't well, there's a lot of history there. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> there's a lot of history on that one between the Russian Empire and the Swedes and the Finns. So yeah, but th that's always been the case, and and uh, this also kind of 
ties into the thing which I don't understand the most about, about a lot of people in the West, is that they tend to buy Putin's justifications for the war, about NATO expansion and all that whatnot, and then they just tend to ignore the facts when it turns out that, hey, NATO did expand, did Putin protest a lot? No, he didn't. And then you still believe that NATO expansion was uh, kind of the cause for the situation. It's just, it's just kind of weird, weird in a way. No, but 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 then then again, this 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 pick what you choose. The, the situation is, is is pretty big there. I mean, what would you expect? This is a real problem for science, though, because if you have scientific censorship going on and you have misleading science filtering to the West, we again might be in danger of accepting science that isn't as well done as it should be or is well done and we question it it's mixed signals in other words from the scientific community standpoint here versus in russia what is the difference i mean can we still trust each other's scientific findings and conclusions depends on which because currently it's super easy sadly to just buy a doctorate in russia ramzan kadyrov has one he uh, can't properly write full sentences. And, and a lot of political leaders in Russia believe in all sorts of pseudoscientific stuff. You really have to check someone's paper. Peer review is absolutely necessary. Trusting scientific papers coming out of Russia really, really depends on what's, what's the subject matter and, and, and whether or not you, you, can, you can relate on that. I wouldn't, basically, if you're a professional who needs to work with someone on a project in a conference, then I guess it would be okay because you're working with another person. But if you're a student, then Googling stuff up and finding things that are, you know, science, Russian scientists have proven X and written a paper about it, I wouldn't be so sure about quoting that in your own work because that could just prove out to be a scam. And this has been encouraged because we, we know that Putin and Defense Minister Shoigu had gone to Siberia in a hiking trip where they performed a shaman ritual where they uh, drank deer blood from, from, from horns or whatever. And he really is afraid of all this spiritualism and whatever. He, th there was a shaman in Siberia uh, in their local religious practice who decided to walk all the way from Vladivostok to Moscow to perform a ritual to exercise Putin. And he was arrested and harassed and now is in the psychic ward because like Putin sent his whole state security apparatus against him. He takes these things super seriously. It's, it's, it's all sorts of all sorts of weird, weird nonsense is, is, is just happening there for, for all their education and everything. This has happened before, though. I mean, this is sort of this sort of thinking is is evocative of Father Grigory Rasputin and Staritz that used to walk around Russia claiming to be the reincarnation of Christ and things like that. So this has been something that's been present in Russian culture for a very long time, right? Yeah, and even in the 90s, in the 90s, the most kind of the most crazy case was where there was one of these um, faith healers, as you would call them in English, who uh, said that people should bring water in front of their TVs and then he would magically charge it to heal all your heal all your troubles. So hey, magical thinking is as widespread as as everywhere. But again, it's it's just a human thing. But what what can you do? I, I and don't and a lot of your listeners currently are laughing at, at the average Russia, Russian about this. And again, you know, because we need to do to get this. But but think about this: if if your local hospital is getting underfunded because currently. Currently in Russia, and I can give you statistics, 17% uh, of hospitals don't have running water in them. And there are fewer hospitals than there were in 1913. Okay, let's just take that as an example. It's super underfunded because of corruption in every level possible. And when you're afraid to go to hospital because you know you won't get treatment there, and when you know that the treatment you'll get is like you can only get it through bribes and everything, and when medical service is not available and you're desperate to find an answer, well, obviously, there will be people who who try to sell you that stuff. People just try to find find some meaning there, and 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 the fact that they they don't trust science as much, and that that it's actively like non scientific thinking is actually promoted because it, in this war there were propaganda posters going out, recruitment posters, which basically stated, "Don't get a college education. That'll just lead to you being fat and and having troubles and mental things. Join the Russian army. You have these wonderful possibilities and all that stuff." Like, can you imagine a government that actively spreads posters stating that people should not go to college? 
No, I can't. I can't fathom that. Well, not, well, now you can, and this has happened, and this is this is the world we where, where we live in now. You know, I, I, I listen to your show for for all the wonderful sci-fi scenarios and 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 all the looks at the future and everything. And sometimes I think, sometimes I think, you know, about about aliens. And and the thing that scares me the most is not if not if not if what if aliens are alien. Sometimes I think, what if they're like us and and, and what if. What if they have their own Putins and something? What what if uh, stuff happened? Like, if we get contacted by aliens, what, what if they're what, what if they're more human than we would like like them to be? And it's kind of strange. The one the one thing about aliens, and this is a this is this is the overarching theme of what I do is that if they exist, they have done whatever they could to be subtle and not talk to us, and maybe we're seeing the reason why. And that maybe they are better than us, you know, if they exist, of course, you have to make a huge assumption there. They may not be there at all. But if they exist out there, they may have simply looked at us and said, they're not worth talking to. And that you have to reach a certain level of social development and technological development to even talk to them. And that may be the simplest solution to the framing paradox is that we're just ants. We're not worth talking to yet. And that's where my headspace lives on that question. But here's what worries me. Aliens can be used as a propaganda tool, and I have been waiting this whole time to see if the Russian propaganda machine decided to say, we found evidence of aliens in order to use it. It would be untrue, but they would just toss it out there as part of their, their propaganda machine to try to throw a wrench in the thinking of the West. Oh, no, 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 no. They're, they're beyond aliens. I mean, they have been saying biolabs and weaponized mosquitoes. But you see, uh, due to the influence of the Orthodox Church, which is sadly uh, very much corrupted by Putin, compromised. They, they use they use that as their excuse. They they, they have chosen God is with us and uh, Jesus supports this war type of side situation. They, they they don't speak about aliens anymore. Aliens remind people of space, and uh, space is one of the areas as we spoke about as we talked about previously that uh, is is not a happy place for Russia right now. So they 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 avoid aliens as much. They, they like to mention conspiracy theories. Uh, for example, they are hugely against the any um, you know the chipping of people when because again this was one of those anti-vaxxer things where where people went around stating that the covid vaccine is actually a microchip inserted under your skin uh, and, and qr codes and everything they, they're against that aliens i think won't get mentioned at all because the alien thing never really caught on here i, I think in eastern europe in general like we, we don't have alien conspiracy theories we have illuminati ones and we have devil worship we like our devil worship you, uh, your official your official Russian instructions for the state uh, media stated that you have to portray Americans and Ukrainians as literally devil worshiping people who sacrifice babies. So they're they're on to that angle. Absolutely amazing that it's 2022 and people think like that still, <laughs> but it, it it it's the reality. And I mean, it doesn't really have you know that sort of a perception doesn't really have an effect in the West because we know that we're not devil worshiping you know baby sacrificing whatever we know that we're not that, in fact, off, to a fault quite often the opposite. But just the idea that you can create an echo chamber still and this has all happened before we you know Nazi Germany and all that where conspiracy theories ruled the day and and people were sort of led into a certain avenue of thinking that isn't objective or valid, but that it can still happen is scary. And I think that is the biggest stumbling block to true world peace is the idea of echo chambers. And we have them here. It still happens here. There's conspiracy theories that are huge in the U.S. But we just, that is the biggest stumbling block is that people are too often led down into these echo chambers and they can sometimes be self-enforced you know, where you only expose yourself to certain media and things like that. And that to me seems like the most dangerous idea that we have in this world today. Yeah, echo chambers are, um, I've studied that since, you know, if it wasn't for the war, I'd be working harder on my PhD in communication sciences. But um, echo chambers are a very interesting tool here because Facebook profits if you live in an echo chamber. And, and, and a lot of social media profits from it. And it's easier to sell you things. And, and, and it's kind of reinforced by their algorithms and everything. 
echo chambers are super dangerous and you have to consciously you know again i like to call this but you have to consciously choose to think for yourself sapere auda as uh, immanuel kant said i'm a huge fan of fan of that guy and philosophy in general it's it's kind of it's it's hard to think for yourself you know it's it's hard to choose to be responsible for their own actions it's hard to it's hard to step out of these these shoes of thinking that that someone else must take care of you it's hard to analyze things on your own Th- that's why so many people aren't scientists or 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 historians or whatever because it requires effort it requires real effort to do that and it's much easier to just allow and and just believe you know blame someone else for your problems blame the other then you're not guilty of anything you're not responsible and and this also not responsible thing and blaming the other this is also is tying in with with how this whole war even started you know it's just russian problems are caused inside russia by their kleptocratic government well how their kleptocratic government can can escape that fact well they can blame ukraine for everything and portray them as evil nazis and send armies in there and start a massive humanistic tragedy because let's blame the other that is why i i really think that scientific thinking and education and everything would be really important and, and, and well it gives you a it gives you a philosophy in which to think yeah, you know, but, but, a method but, but, that you can cross check with other people and you can't really do that in the conspiracy theory world yeah the, that again science has its, has its own problems right now i mean uh again my my major was was political philosophy but i've read a lot of science philosophy as well uh, mr karl popper is a very interesting dude <laughs> i mean text and everything but but then uh you know there are people who have faked data and faked stuff for their own benefit like there was this uh, i think it was german guy who uh faked his silicone uh, silicone superconductivity things and that happened in bell labs out of all places oh it's, it's that has it's happened, happened too. Well, it's happened recently in paleontology i can't go deeply into that subject but their faked data does exist and egos and one-upmanship and things like that does exist in science of course yeah, but 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 that's but that's the biggest issue with with, with this, and uh, this is not the subject of today's conversation. I'm just stating that from the sidelines, you know, science can't it already peer reviews the data, but if science would spend a lot more time not trusting each scientist, and if they would have to actually recheck if the person is being honest himself, that would just make everything just halt. So science relies. On, on the level of trust between experts, so to say, so to speak, you have to rely the, on the fact that the, the data that you're using are, have been gathered and and given to you, and that you're using the stuff or or just reading stuff from a person that has best ideas in his head or something that he's honest. There are people who will abuse that. And there, there's a certain level of trust involved, no matter what. Especially these days, when you know it's not 19th century anymore, where everyday science. That, that's why we have. That's why we need to have science science communicators today, since science has become way too complex for the you know, average person to understand it as is. Like you, you can't really just pick up a scientific journal and just just read the articles there because you probably won't understand the lingo in the first place which means it's harder for the general public to, to check on cheaters. But scientists are not usually good at checking at cheaters. Well, it's they, they're they good at checking at cheaters because they're skeptics by nature. But at the same time, if you, as you say, you read a modern scientific paper, especially an astrophysics paper like I do, the only thing you can do as a communicator is boil it down, you know, boil it down to its most common denominator. And there are subjects within science, believe it or not, that are very difficult to do that with. You know, what, you, you know what's the worst? You know what's the worst part that got popular here, um, and, and also like in Russia, the fact that there are a lot of scientists who are really good at their fields. For example, um, like we have in Latvia this uh, Kalvinch dude, who's a chemist. He invented uh, meldonium, the, the heart medicine that's also kind of a doping drug for sports sports people and he's a genius chemist but the problem is he's also a bit well weird since he likes to comment on things way outside his area and in those areas he believes total nonsense so he endorses for example so he, he endorsed uh, some beauty product 
thing like magical crystals or something and then you know people on the outside they only see the fact that he's well a famous scientist but he's endorsing something that he has no knowledge about and that's how you can do stuff. Could there be a profit motive for that though i mean could he be working a grift uh, yeah possibly but then again that's that's everywhere and that's just being human it's called human experience but for example you know that's that's at least <laughs> And this this comes uh, this comes like um, I I normally explain so history, at least for you, the, you communicate science, and then then there are facts that you can just point at. But but for me, when I try to explain, for example, life in the Soviet Union, there's a lot of things that I've I've put on the show, and then just people just don't believe you, and 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 it's hard to give a written record on them because those were things that were criminal in nature, so people wouldn't write them down, and then you kind of have to rely on interpretations and anecdotal evidence, which is just. Just a bit bizarre all over. It happens the other way, though, because I could point towards the Flat Earth Movement, which is surprisingly large <laughs> in the West. That something that's very, very easily disproven is still clinged on to. They have members all around the globe, John. And people sometimes, they, they do it because it, it feels like being part of a club, you know, well, special knowledge uh, and things like that. And, so you, you have this effect in the West as well. And also, yeah, but like, again, that's reminded me of, of our original subject. There is also still pseudoscientific theories used for political power there. Uh, have you heard of Alexander Dugin? No, tell us. Alexander Dugin is, um, he's written the books that Putin's read that influence his ideology. Those are, he claims to be a historian and he claims a lot of things, but he's influenced and, and worked with the, the lost time theory. He, in essence, believes that uh, all the history from uh, Charlemagne to Napoleon is basically fictitious and that the West put that in to make Russia look bad. And that Russia, and it's actually like 700 years earlier, and that uh, Russia is just destined to be this great civilization. They just use all that all all this mysterious stuff because again in, in a weird sense putin's government tries to subdue real education and real science because educated people cause a lot of mess but they want to look good on paper and it's easy to to do people who are poorly educated so they tend to rely and give grants and funds to very dubious people with with ridiculous theories and whatever as as long as it as long as it suits suits their own needs and that's that's one thing that i, I really kind of that i really kind of find, find hard to explain because even in soviet union there was like internal competition there wasn't one rocket bro or one plane bro meanwhile in in russia even this this competition has like been exterminated completely it's just sort of a simplified simplified economically society i suppose because that's what you get when you basically sell off uh, the majority parts of all the airplane constructors to, to one oligarch or something the whole thing is scary and sad Christophs, thanks for joining us today and everybody should check out Christophs' podcast the eastern border if you're interested in geopolitics and the situation in ukraine and i i just i just hope for a solution you know a, a, a that that a, a good solution and world peace that's what i hope for and like i always say on my show which is my show's tagline uh, happiness is mandatory yes it is event horizon and my channel are now available as a podcast on apple podcasts spotify and youtube memberships early ad free episodes bonus episodes and sleep focused content sign up now by clicking the links below to your platform of choice.